Thank you. Right, let me ask this question to start us off, and that is just, who are you really? In your heart, in your heart of hearts, who are you really? And so for our purpose statement for today, since we need to have a nice, thir- I, think, well, I can't think I counted, I think it's like 14 words, but you know, uh, is as Christians, we are people who trust God, and that trust should play out in our lives. Okay, so as Christians, we're people who trust God, and that trust should play out in our lives. So I'm going to go ahead and just try to alienate everybody in here with this illustration right here, okay? So we're going to start off talking about Harry Potter, okay? Sound good? All right, so if I didn't alienate you on spiritual grounds, I'm going to alienate you on uh, on massive nerd grounds. So I'm glad my wife is not in here yet because she'd be super embarrassed. Okay, so uh, Harry Potter, for those of you who don't know, little orphan boy. Um, And the point that I want to make about this today is there's this part in the first book where he is like wandering around his little magical school. And as he's doing that, he stumbles into this room where he finds this mirror. Um, And as he's looking in this mirror, so he's an orphan, he sees his entire family, extended family, his parents, his grandparents. He's never seen any of them before, and he's just amazed. He just wants to spend all of his time looking at this. And so he brings some of his friends in, but they see different things. And what he ends up kind of coming to realize is that people who look in this mirror see, like, the deepest desires of their heart. They see, like, what they really want the most in the world. And so what I want you to think about is if we had a mirror like that up here, and you could just come up and look in that mirror, nobody else can see it, it's just you, what are you going to see? What's the deepest desires of your heart? What do you believe is going to make you the most happy, bring you the most joy, bring you the most satisfaction in your life? So just hold that image in your head. And we're going to look today at Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. It's a passage I'm sure that a lot of you are very familiar with, common passage, probably a passage I've preached on more than anything else, um, but it's one that I'm constantly being brought back to and challenged with and convicted with. So Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, as most of you already know, the book of Galatians is written by Paul to a group of churches in like modern day Turkey, Asia Minor. Um, And he's writing to them because there's this serious problem during this time period with uh, the Jewish community trying to reconcile this new Christian faith with their traditional Jewish faith. And they're teaching these people in these Galatian churches that they need to be circumcised, that they need to follow some of the traditional um, Jewish laws and Jewish practices. And if we could really sum up the entire theme of Galatians, it's probably going to be just a couple of verses before this, where Paul says in verse 16 of chapter 2, he says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So he's he's challenging these people who are trying to basically prove themselves to earn their justification in Christ, to basically take the gospel plus their works, their self-discipline, their radical... um, you know, spiritual commitment, uh, even to the point of circumcision as adults, as converts, to, uh, to prove that they're justified before God. And, and the thing is, our culture is, is not like that that much in a lot of ways. Yes, there are some people who, uh, who kind of fall into this trap of legalism. But if we, if we had to say uh, an American church, um, it, which, which group the American church is like, it's going to be more like the Corinthians than it is the Galatians. It's going to be people who are more libertine, who are more, um, yeah, I'm fine with God, even though I'm not living like God at all, even though I'm not self-disciplined at all. Um, And so that kind of led me a little bit at times to to misinterpret, I think, Galatians 2.20. I want to get into why that happened. But in order to do that, I I want us to ask three questions of ourselves as we're really trying to see if we're people who trust God in our hearts. As we're holding this mirror up to ourselves and asking ourselves, who are we? What is our heart? Let's, let's ask these three questions. So first of all, 
Has our old man been crucified? Has our sinful person been crucified? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, he says. And so that crucifixion of our old person comes as salvation. It's something that was accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. So that's a one-time event. If you become a Christian, then your old person has been crucified with Jesus on the cross. But it's also an ongoing process of continuously putting to death our old man, putting to death the sin in our lives, putting to death our flesh. As John Owen would say, uh, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And so it's an ongoing kind of a process. And a few things that would be evident in our lives if we are killing sin, if our sinfulness is being crucified on a daily basis, um, is that continual killing of our own desires and our own flesh. Um, it's a it's a constant dependence on Jesus and not on ourselves. To be crucified with Christ means that our self-sufficiency is broken and replaced with a real dependence on Jesus Christ. So everything that we desired, everything that we wanted, everything that we thought would make us happy before, all of our own self-reliance, all of our own self-sufficiency, those things are crucified with Christ on the cross, and our dependence is placed fully on him. The second question we want to ask ourselves is, is what lives in me? What lives in me? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And Paul wrote in another passage over in a letter to Titus, he wrote in Titus chapter 2, something I think is going to shed some light on this for us. He said this in Titus 2, verse 11. He said, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who were zealous for good works. And so this is a picture that we have of what the person who has truly been transformed, who, who Christ is living through them, is what their life is going to look like. He says the grace of God has appeared, has brought us salvation, and it trains us, so trains us, to, to renounce ungodliness, to crucify our flesh, to crucify our sinfulness, to crucify worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, that's a key word there, self-controlled, self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who were zealous for good work. So it's a, it's a kind of people that he's creating. It's a kind of people that he's forming. It's a kind of people that he is building. If he is living in us and through us, then we're going to reflect him. We're going to look like him. It's a natural thing that's going to be happening. And it's not just a one and done kind of a thing that we see. He is actively making us. There's this constant reality of, yes, we have been redeemed. We have been saved. He has won us for himself. We are his own possession. But he is also still in the process of making us. He's still in the process of changing us and forming us into his image. So when we're saved, we all of a sudden have the power. We have the ability to, to be self-controlled to be self-disciplined, when before that, before Christ, before he regenerated us, before he took out our heart of stone and gave us a heart of flesh, we didn't have the ability to do that at all. We didn't have the ability to be self-controlled. We didn't have the ability to live uh, as Christ would live. He wasn't living through us in that way. And the reality is that this should change our desires. This should change our wants. Jesus would use the illustration of a tree and say a good tree is going to bear good fruit. A bad tree is going to bear bad fruit. And so if we've been redeemed, if we've been changed, if we've been fundamentally changed into to Christ living through us, then we should bear the kind of fruit that Christ bore. 
as just a natural outflow of that. Not because we're trying to do that. Not because we're trying to justify ourselves. But because Christ is living in us and living through us. And as a natural outflow of that, we are producing the kind of fruit that he would produce in us. And the final, the third question that I want to ask is, is who do you truly trust? And this one I want to spend a little time focusing on today. So if we go back to that main statement that we made at the beginning, it's about faith. It's about trust in God. As Christians, we're a people who trust God, and that trust plays out in our lives. So who do we truly trust? Who do we truly have faith in? Obviously, as as people who are, who are Christians in this room, we're going to say that we have faith in Jesus Christ. We're going to say that we trust him. Nobody who's a, who's a Christian is not going to say and acknowledge that. But once again, if we have this mirror in front of us that shows us that inward reality of our hearts, what's really going to show up there on a daily basis? Um, what's going to show up for us, you know, when it's a Monday or Tuesday or a Thursday and we're having a hard time at work or when we're wanting just time for ourselves or when we're looking for some kind of a way just to find satisfaction for us in our lives. Who do we really trust? Do we believe God and take him as his word and respond in the reality of that truth or do we uh, kind of separate that from our everyday life and the way that we're living in a regular everyday? So do you truly trust God or not? The thing is we don't naturally trust God. We don't naturally trust God. When we're born in sin, our flesh is sinful. It wants to be self-reliant and self-dependent. And it brings us back to the first part that we just read on why we need to continually be killing sin in our lives because we have to constantly crucify self-sufficiency and self-dependence and self-trust. We want to trust ourselves and put faith in ourselves to bring us salvation, to bring us peace, to bring us joy, to bring us happiness. I can provide those things for myself. Sure, I, I don't want to go to hell one day. I want to. There's a little of this trust in God, but our loyalties are divided a lot of times between Jesus and in ourselves. And there's always, it seems like, certain areas where we really struggle to believe God. We really struggle to trust Him. There's some areas that we're forced to trust Him in, but there are other areas we want to kind of hold back and keep to ourselves and say, well, for this, I don't necessarily really believe Him. I, I want to believe myself in this specific area. I want to believe m- that my own way is better than his way, that my own thoughts are better than his thoughts. And here's the thing. Um, this one really struck me because I know as, as somebody who kind of came into Reformed um, theology like a little bit later in my life, so this idea that God is sovereign, that I'm saved through grace, it's none of my own works, none of my own do- doing, um, I kind of came into this uh, as a, in my early 20s, and um, it was revolutionary for me, and I would read a passage like this, and I, I kind of had this misunderstanding, I think, that God was sort of just going to magically, as, as he was living through me, he was just going to sort of magically do the work for me, okay? He was just going to, you know, I can't try to do this at all. I'm just going to suddenly not want or not desire anything sinful anymore. And it was really divorcing the self-control aspect of, of faith from this. It was, dis, it was removing the discipline aspect from faith. And part of that was kind of taking a, a passage in Galatians that was written for a people who were struggling with legalism and then trying to apply it to, pe- to somebody who was struggling with more, I can kind of live however I want to live and still be a, a godly Christian. And so one of the things I think that's helpful for us is, is we make sure we hold all the teachings of Paul and, and his teachings in, in, in unity with each other and not try to just pull one thing out. And so a passage that was really helpful is 1 Corinthians. If you look back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, another verse that you're familiar with. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we have an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 
So I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So that faith, that trust, it's not just him taking uh, something magically and putting this faith inside of me. He gives us the power and the ability through his son Jesus, the Holy Spirit working in our hearts to sanctify us, to have the ability to be self-controlled and to live self-controlled lives in the world. We see this clearly in both the passage in Titus that we read and the passage in 1 Corinthians that we read, the thing that I was missing much of the time is this idea of self-control, that I have the ability to discipline myself and to be self-controlled in this world. But it's not a discipline of, oh, I'm going to work really hard to be really good. I'm not going to fall back into this gl- the trap that the Galatians were falling into. It's disciplined at putting myself underneath the teachings of the gospel, putting myself at uh, under, uh, with brothers and sisters who are going to preach the gospel to me, being disciplined to, to be with the body of Christ where I can hear the gospel proclaimed, I can hear the truth proclaimed, is being disciplined in, in putting myself into the presence of Jesus and to the knowledge of the truth. That's what's going to change me as a person. That's when it's, what's going to produce this life in us and through us. So we, we're called to be disciplined but, and self-controlled but in a way that's going to cause us to rely and depend on him even more. So to, to kind of apply this back to our daily lives and to, to close this out. So we're going to discipline ourselves to kill sin through prayer and confession. That's the challenge that we have. To discipline ourselves to, to, discipline ourselves to follow the means that he has given us. That doesn't always necessarily line up with our logic. You know, we're not, we're not disciplining ourselves in the same way necessarily that a boxer or a runner would. We're disciplining ourselves in the way that he has called us to do. And he calls us to not give up meeting together, to not give up confessing our sins one to another, to not, to not neglect um, the teaching of the word, because the Holy Spirit's going to work through the word of God being proclaimed to us from people in our in our church through our dna groups through our life groups through our sunday morning services as the words proclaimed through worshiping together through participating in communion one with the other in every one of these elements the gospel is proclaimed to us and as we discipline ourselves in those things then god is going to change our hearts on a daily basis to make us more like him and to produce that fruit in us and through us so we discipline ourselves in the, the, the way that God has provided for us and the means that he has given us. We discipline ourselves by putting ourselves in the presence of God and, and in the lives of other believers so they can speak truth through us, truth to us. And then we discipline our trust. And this one that becomes a little bit more difficult at times, but, and that's why we need to constantly be coming back to the scriptures. And, and I want to, to bring back to mind the image of that mirror for just a second, because the Word of God really is the mirror that reveals the intentions of our hearts in ways that we can't do on our own. We're in the Scriptures because the Holy Spirit shows us who we really are there, shows us where we're not trusting Him and what it looks like to actually believe and follow Him. Trusting Him practically means we believe what He tells us in His Word, and then we act in response to that. And there are lots of times where that's not going to make logical sense, it's not going to make practical sense. It's not going to seem like something that you should do. But at the end of the day, the discipline comes in in just doing it. You know, I, God, I believe in you. Help my unbelief. That needs to be a constant kind of cry of our hearts as we go through this. Um, so that's what I want to challenge us with today. Um, there's one I leave you with uh, this quote from a if I haven't alienated you with Harry Potter, we'll alienate you with uh, Ricky Gervais. So the great uh, atheist, Ricky Gervais, who likes to troll Christians a lot of times. Um, I heard him say this quote. He said, if you're a good person, then doing whatever you want is the same as doing good. And he's kind of saying this is in a way to say you don't really need God in a lot of ways. But as, as believers, we know that we can't truly be good apart from God. And I think that his point is actually pretty pretty good. You're going to do whatever kind of person you are. So whatever's in your heart, that's what's going to come out of you. Whatever's in your heart is, is what your actions are going to be. 
And so for us as Christians, if we truly are believers in Christ, then what should come out of us is the actions of Christ. If we truly trust God, then what should be coming out of our hearts and coming out of our lives is a demonstration of that trust, that we're doing the things that he has asked us to do, that we're believing the things that he is, he's, uh, he's required of us. Um, so that's the challenge for us today. So let me pray, and um, I'll be done. So Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how you teach us and challenge us and instruct us in it. Um, Lord, I pray, first of all, just, I, I want to thank you for the fact that um, in spite of my, at times, lack of self-control, in spite of my uh, believing myself, um, that you have been patient, that you have consistently put people in my life who pointed me back to the truth, who preached the gospel to me with their words and with their lives, that your spirit was able to work to, to bring about change and to help me to trust you more. And Lord, I pray that you would just continue every single day to help me and to help us as a people to believe you and to trust you and to put our hope in you and not ourselves. As much as that's going to go against everything inside of us at times to, to trust you and not ourselves, I pray that you would help us to be disciplined in doing that. And Lord, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus and all that he's done for us and all that he's doing. It's in his name we pray. Amen.